All right, friends. So in this set of notes, we're going to be looking at experimental design and conducting a completely randomized design experiment. So in 1933, three Mozart researchers conducted an experiment to determine whether listening to Mozart's music would improve performance on spatial reasoning tasks. So they used 36 college students as subjects. Um, Frances Rauscher uh, and her colleagues randomly assigned 12 students to each treatment group. Group 1 listened to a 10-minute uh, selection of Mozart's sonata. Group 2 played a relaxation tape with the sound mixed for 10, set, 10 minutes. And Group 3 sat in silence for 10 minutes and served as the control group. Um, each subject completely completed a pretest two days before the treatment was given and then a post-test immediately following the treatment. What do we think was the result of this experiment? Well, we're going to explore that today um, with all of you as uh, test subjects. So I'm going to go through these notes, um, skipping over that part, but this is something that you'll be able to do in class. So we're going to, again, we're going to be trying this experiment. We're going to see what happens. But in order to do this, we need to make sure we follow the principles of experimental design. So number one, we need to control for lurking variables. This does not mean we need a control group. Um, in fact, sometimes it is um, unethical for us to have a control group. So for example, if we're treating a patient, um, then it would be unethical for us to give that patient no treatment at all if there's one that already exists. So we would have to compare against what is the um, current treatment um, so we'd be testing against the current treatment because if somebody's sick and we have some medicine to give them, we have to give them medicine. It's unethical for us to be like, oh, I'm going to pretend to give you medicine, but you're not actually getting any medicine at all, um, which may, you know, result in bad uh, things happening. So don't always need a control group. Often we will, but don't always need some. And in fact, so sometimes it's unethical to have one. But we do need to make sure we're controlling for lurking variables. And one of the ways we can do this is by randomly assigning individuals um, into our different treatment groups. So that way that hopefully any lurking variables, any variables that might be causing confounding, um, <clears throat> will be split up evenly amongst the groups on average. Second thing we need to do is uh, randomly assign. So this controls for lurking variables, um, but we need to make sure we're doing this in an unbiased way. Um, again, helps create roughly equivalent groups by balancing the effects of lurking variables that aren't controlled on the treatment groups. And then our third thing, we need to make sure that um, if we were to, so the way we define replication in this class is if we were going to um, repeat this process over, we should get roughly the same results. And the way we achieve this is by having a large enough sample size. Um, ideally, we will repeat experiments over and over to test against um, results that were seen in other studies. Um, but if we take a large enough sample size, hopefully that means that um, these re the results will be approximately the same. So um, what you'll be doing in class after these notes is taking part in an experiment to determine whether listening to classical or contemporary music helps students complete a maze task more quickly. Um, you're going to work with a partner to collect your data. Um, each of you will first complete the maze with no music. Then the class will be divided up into three groups for your second maze. Group one will complete the second maze with no music. Group two will complete the maze with classical music. And group three will complete the maze with contemporary music. Um, and there are some songs for the 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and 2020s. Um, so you can choose, we'll vote as a class uh, to see which one of those you want to complete uh, after we get through these notes. So yada, 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 you'll take a look at your average time, you'll take a look at the standard deviation of the change in time, and then um, you'll decide uh, what you think. Does this show the uh, significant decrease in time it took to complete the maze if you listen to one of the musics, one of the types of music? So does that mean that we can conclude that listening to music, one type of music can aid in concentration and spatial reasoning? Well, you all aren't a random sample, so for this answer it would be no. Um, for AP statistics students or for AP statistics students in your class, you might be able to make a conclusion based on your results. Um, 
but because you're not a random sample, um, no, we can't. So in this experiment, um, the experimental units are students. The experimental units are the individuals that the treatments get assigned to. <clears throat> when experimental units are humans, then we can call them subjects. Otherwise, we would just call them experimental units. The explanatory variable is the um, independent variable. It's going to be the type of music that we choose to assign. We can also call the explanatory variable a factor. So this is a very vocab intensive unit. Um, I would make flashcards for all of these um, different vocabulary terms. So explanatory variable, experimental units, factor, I would be making flashcards for each of these. Um, each explanatory, the explanatory variable in this case has two levels, and they were classical and contemporary music. Um, so the no music isn't actually a level in this case because it's not, um, it's not assigning anything as opposed to assigning one of our types. Our response variable, that's going to be our dependent variable. In this case, it's going to be the time to complete the maze. It's what's measured. And our treatments are going to be classical, contemporary music. And actually, I would add no music to the treatment one. So you can add no music there. Um, I'll make sure for the slideshow that you all have um, that it includes the no music on there. Um, so I would consider this control group to be one of the treatments because you're being assigned no music. And what are some potential lurking variables? Well, the maze difficulty, right? Perhaps um, some people had harder ma mazes and, and that difficulty makes it look like it takes more time. So in this experiment, when you have lurking variables, um, it has the potential to become a confounding variable. Basically, what a confounding variable is when a lurking variable messes up your results. So lurking variables are things that we aren't testing for that may explain our results. If they do explain our results, if they are screwing up our study, then they become a confounding variable. But when we follow the principles of experimental design, we are trying to do our best to prevent lurking variables to cause confounding. So how do we incorporate the principles of experimental design? Well. We controlled for lurking variables to try to download mazes of similar d difficulty. We also randomly assigned students into one of the three treatment groups, so perhaps people who had better spatial reasoning or quicker to learn uh, how to do mazes. Those should be split evenly amongst the three groups. And in this case, our sample size isn't quite great. Um, it would have been nice to have more subjects, but we did the best that we could, right? So here we have an experimental design diagram. Um, and this basically walks through how we um, set up our experiment. So in this case, we had our students here, which we randomly assigned to three different groups. We had the contemporary music, the classical music, and the no music group or group A, group B, group C. The treatments that we have here, so these are the groups. The treatments that we have here, you can also skip this by the way, are um, again our contemporary, our classical, or our no music. And we measured the time difference in um, completing the maze as our last response variable. So these are our subjects. These are randomly assigning to our groups. These are our treatments. And then finally, we have our response variable. Now, this is a great way to organize your thoughts, but it is not required on the AP exam or on my test. And in fact, you are not graded on your experimental design diagram. You are just going to be uh, graded on how you write up, how you set up your uh, experimental uh, design. So again, if you're asked to design, uh, describe the design of an experiment on the AP exam, Diagram is a way for you to organize your thoughts, but that's not what you're graded on. You're going to be expected to explain how the experimental units are randomly assigned to treatments in enough detail so someone else can carry out that method in, exact, in exactly the same way, and you must clearly state what is going to be measured. All right, let's take a look at an example. Many students are regularly, uh, sorry, regularly consume caffeine to help them stay alert. 
Half of the 30 students are randomly assigned to either caffeinated soda or decaffeinated soda. Each student is assigned a number from 0, 1 to 30. Uh, and the first 15 two-digit numbers that appear in a random uh, number table will receive caffeine. Repeated numbers will be disregarded. Yay! We talked about repeated numbers. We talked about two-digit numbers going across um, a random number table at two-digit, finding two-digit numbers, and we're re disregarding repeats. Sorry. The remaining subjects will receive the decaffeinated soda. Once sodas have been administered, the students will wait 30 minutes and perform a reflex test using the smartphone app. Their speed in seconds is recorded. So this is a great example of how to write an experimental design. That's not where we're interested in right now, though we could be. So first thing we want to do is identify our subjects. Who are our subjects? Well, in this case, our subjects would be the 30 students. What would our explanatory variable be here? Well, explanatory variable here would be the um, caffeine. And are there any levels? Well, there's going to be two levels, the caffeinated and decaffeinated soda. Our response variable is going to be our speed um, in seconds of the reflux test. Our treatments, again, are going to be the caffeinated and decaffeinated soda. Um, in this case, there's not going to be control groups, so there's nobody having no soda at all. And the lurking variables you may have here are some students just being better, although randomly assigning them um, to treatment groups hopefully will even that out. Um, another potential lurking variable that I thought of is sugar. Right, sugar content of the sodas. Is that the same? Is that different? Could that be affecting the reflexes as well? So go ahead and see if you can create your experimental design diagram for this. And then this type of uh, experiment that we just explored is called the completely randomized design experiment. Right? And that's when our original list, all individuals, are just randomly assigned to a treatment. Now, let's say that we had each subject flip a coin to determine the treatment. Um, if the student flips heads, they drink caffeine. If they flip tails, they drink decaf. As long as all 30 students flip the coin, it is still a completely randomized design. However, we might not get 15 students in each group. So it works, but it could be better. So if we try to force the groups to have equal size by having the students flip a coin until there are 15 subjects in the caffeine uh, group, and then the remaining students are not being assigned to the treatment, it's possible that the students that are flipping more quickly have a better chance of being in the caffeine group than those um, who are maybe flipping more slowly. So that wouldn't work. That's bias. So on the AP exam, the hat method might be the best to randomly assign treatments whenever possible. Um, what I really recommend is choose one technique that you feel like you can write really, really, really well. Um, learn how to write it perfectly and then just use that one over and over and over again. If you choose the hat method to do this, you must make sure to mention each subject uh, name is written on equal sized pieces of paper and the hat is shaken before individuals were picked. All right, another example. In an experiment, or an experiment is conducted to see whether the type of liquid and temperature of the liquid affects the rate at which bags of 18 M&Ms melt. This experiment is carried out using salt water, milk, and Pepsi that is either hot or cold. In this case, our experimental units are going to be our m &Ms. Our explanatory variables, in this case we have more than one, are the type of liquid and the temperature of the liquid. Is there more than one level? Yeah, absolutely. So the type of liquid has three levels, salt water, milk, and Pepsi. Our temperature has two levels, hot and cold. In this case, the time to melt will be our response variable. So what are our treatments? Well, we can use a table to create our treatments. So we have hot salt water, cold salt water, hot milk, cold milk, and hot Pepsi or cold Pepsi. How could we assign them? 
Well, since there are six treatments and 18 experimental units, three units will be randomly assigned to each treatment. Label a bowl of varying liquids um, and temperatures with the numbers from 1 to 6. Assign each M&M a number from, zero, or from 1 to 18. Place the numbers 1 to 18 on pieces of paper of equal size and place them in a bag. Shake the bag and select three numbers at uh, one at a time. Leave them out of the bag. So without replacement is another way that we can express that. Um, these three M&Ms will see, receive treatment one. The same process will be conducted to, to assign the rest of the M&Ms to the remaining treatments. And then the last thing I would mention for this um, is um, the time it takes to melt will be measured. You can take a moment to draw your experimental design diagram. This is what mine looks like. Again, you can skip this middle step right here. And this is not what you'll be graded on. What we did above is what you'll be graded on. Hope you found this useful. Have a wonderful day.